We can start it up the recording here. Uh, so what I was saying is there's many there's many desirable features of uh, of age based modeling. Um, one of the most central features is the ability to capture heterogeneity differences between agents in a more scalable way than for aggregate modeling. And normally we're used to thinking about the attributes associated with an agent as being numbers or categories or something like that. But a very important type of attribute is relationships, um, relational quantities, their, their relations to others, for example. And it's very common that in our models, we have relationships to other agents. And when we have each agent having potential relations to others, whether it's people to people or people to service dogs or people to you know, the university in which they're enrolled or what have you, whatever the, the agent types are, um, whether they're links within a given type of agent or between types of agents, we have networks defined. These networks have nodes and they have links. And I noted that a distinction between networks and graphs, as we might have encountered them in, um, in, in many classes, is networks routinely have information associated with the links. With graphs, we talk about edges and vertices. With, uh, node, with networks, we talk about links and nodes. But the real, the most common difference is we have, um, we have extra information commonly in networks. So links are associated with additional types of information, showing the nature of the connection or the strength of the connection, the type of the connection, et cetera. And it turns out that networks have really profound impacts on agents. We represent them because they matter. Um, just like we put spatial environments into a model, because it's important for answering certain types of questions. We put networks in our models to capture certain types of processes. Um, uh, I've listed a few things here. Um, sometimes networks link you into resources. The fact that I have a primary care physician means I can get care from this doctor, this physician. That's a resource. Yes. Sure. What I was going to say is, one of the big motivations for having a network is because it represents people's ability to access resources. So for example, if I have a, a primary care physician, that allows me to go get checked out for a medical appointment. And, and so you can imagine a, a network between agents or people in the population and their primary care physician if they have one. And that would be a network, right? You'd have nodes being people in the population and physicians, and links between them would indicate, hey, this person in the population is this physician, is their primary care physician, or for a physician, it would indicate their patients, right? Um, or there could be a link between a person and the university, and, and that would allow them to take classes at the university, what have you. So one of the reasons we represent networks is because we want to be able to represent access of agents to resources that matter. Another might be if it influences their perception. You know, the fact that I have networks around me of, of, in my family means I'm going to hear if one of my family members gets COVID. And that's going to affect my perception about how frequently COVID strikes people and how serious COVID is. If COVID has taken one of my family members and ended them up in the hospital, that's going to affect my perception of its severity. So networks affect my perception, just like geographic space affects my perception. If I see someone else nearby who's um, you know, really sick, that's going to affect my perception of the um, the commonness of, of, of illness around me. But through networks is another way to represent that. Um, but they also mediate the spread of what I'll say is influence, contagion. Maybe it's rumors. Maybe it's disinformation or misinformation, like Russia is spreading about Ukraine, for example, and the invasion of Ukraine, or um, or people spread about you know, COVID and 
a colleague in LA sent me the other day a um, uh, thing sent shared to her by one of her rural classmates in Singapore, which was kind of graphic from Canada. Man, you gotta see this stuff. This is like it's hard to believe. I I've done to show it. Um mind you, it's it's misinformation, but um I think you'd get a kick out of it. So give me a give me a second here. I'll actually got to show this to you. Um, this is a sort of just nonsense that that circulates um, uh, around, you know, in terms of misinformation. Um, and uh, she was asking me, like, is this fake? Is this fake news? God, how could you how could you look at this and not know it was fake news? Um, so you got to you got to look at this. Uh, OK, um, I, sh I should do a test. Like, how many ways can you can you figure out that this is like totally bogus? This is not like complete crap. Um, sorry, I shouldn't, I mean, I shouldn't use those terms, but this is much worse than those terms. Um, so is it the, you know, a syringe pointed at Justin Trudeau's head? Maybe, maybe that suggests that this is not like real news. You know, um, maybe it's the fact that Canada is misspelled panda up here. Um, maybe, maybe that suggests it's not official government of Canada, you know, like documentation. Um, maybe it's the fact that they refer to it as triple vaccinated, which is not how the health system describes this. Um, uh, maybe it's the fact that it's from the exposed uh, UK rather than, you know, government of Canada. Um, Canada official information, government of Canada information. Um, uh, you know, how many different ways can you figure out this is, is total nonsense? So this is the sort of stuff which spreads via social networks, right? Um, and I'm not saying social networks only spread disinformation. Of course, they spread misinformation and disinformation, but they also spread real information. And that's one of the, the, the difficult things. So the point is they, they serve as to influence they spread um, virus. If it's a network of people together where the connections indicate proximity, right? Um, someone are in the same box or they're nearby each other within a few meters. It can spread rumors. It can spread innovation, right? Like the spread of, of, of innovative practices. Someone says, oh, I heard about this really cool new app and others learn about it and start adopting it or what have you. Um, so networks serve as this really important um, mechanism of diffusion of information, percolation of information from one place to another. Information, influence, um, or, inf uh, or you know, um, uh, cause and effect from one place to another. So networks are, are actually really important in, in understanding dynamics in the world. Representing networks with an aggregate model is, is very difficult because we don't represent individuals. We don't represent the nodes, or if you prefer the vertices. Um, and it's hard to, to capture that. Next time we'll, we'll see there are ways we can approximate it, but it's, it's pretty, pretty limited. By contrast, if we have an agent-based model, um, we can readily represent individuals as nodes, whether they represent people or institutions or community groups, you know, community organizations or or uh, companies or or service dogs or you know caregivers or what have you. We can represent those readily, um, and we can have links between them that are defined in different ways. Okay, so I had asked you to load in this model. And if anyone was not there then, you, please load it in now. SIRS model, ABM, and SD for alternative networks. It's up on the Canvas site, okay? Um, and we're gonna be exploring the impacts of networks because network come in a variety of facets. There's a variety of types of networks. Not all networks are made the same. Um, and they differ in the structure of the network, but the structure of the network leads to differences in behavior or structure of what happens over time from that network. Just as 
the model structure, the fact that you know we have a connection back from recovered back to susceptible or not, just as that influences the behavior of that model. Network structure also influences behavior of the model in profound ways. It influences behavior of, say, contagion spread. So we're going to be using that model to explore um, it. Now, in order to do this, I'm going to switch to said model. Okay, so here we go. And uh, I'm going to call up any logic here. Okay. Um, so let me just uh, introduce you a little bit to this model. Okay, so this is this is a model which is going to show a couple of things. The first thing is we have a population in it of agents. Um, and we're going to be evolving that population at an individual base level. So for each member of this population, we're going to have a person. Um, who can be in a set of states illustrated by this. It's a classic SIR model. People get exposed to infection. They either get infected or not with a certain roll of the dice. And uh, if they're infected, they can infect others. Eventually they recover. And after some amount of time, they lose their immunity and go back to susceptible, right? Um, Familiar territory, presumably from past work, from your assignment, et cetera. Okay, um, but alongside of that, in Maine, we're going to be running a stock and flow model of the same basic structure susceptibles, effectives, and recoveries. And there's going to be a comparable use of parameters between them. So we're going to be assuming for the stock and flow model parameters that are the same value as the corresponding parameters in the agent-based model. They're going to be running side by side. An agent-based version of the model, kind of looking at this process in the world with an agent-based lens at an individual level over here, and then over here at the level of, of the aggregate, just counting the number of susceptible infected on recovering and having people mix with others according to a contact rate and a transmission program. That's what we're gonna be doing at the same time, okay? And this presages our taking a look at hybrid models and coming class. We're gonna be weaving these together because these days, ladies and gentlemen, it's not a matter of picking one method or another. Each of the methods has features that recommend it for certain types of needs. But the best use of these methods is not to just build a model only in one method, it's to weave them together artfully, to have certain sections of your model be built in one method, which are best fitted to that method, and other sections of your model in another method, and to evolve that boundary as your learning evolves. We're going to be coming to that. Don't think it's one or the other. You have to put your stake in the ground and only use one method. No, no, no. That's how we used to do things. That was my generation. But for decades now, I've been promoting hybrid models. Um, to some resistance, but it's uh, an incredibly powerful technique. And it's taken some years for the packages to catch up with our needs. But with any logic, it's reasonably good. So we're going to be running these side by side. Okay. so. Our focus today is going to be the impact of networks. Let's go see where networks live in this model. Okay, uh, Jake, question? Okay, um, so let's go see where networks live in this model if we could. So we're going to go click on main, and I'm going to zoom into properties here. And if you scroll down in properties, what you will find is that there is a space and network area. There's kind of an accordion menu, and you can you can sort of expand it here. Um, you may have to expand it. But what you'll see is that there's a, a choice of network type here. So in other words, you can say for the populations in this in Maine, populations that live in Maine, um, what network do you want to impose? Okay. Um, uh, if indeed you 
launch and close an hour. And so you can select here from any number of different networks, and we're going to explore them. Okay. Now, the first one we're going to explore is a particularly simple one. Okay. And it's going to be called a random network. Okay. Um, uh, random networks. Uh, now, random networks are go actually by a variety of, of formal names. Okay. Um, and uh, they're called variously Poisson random, um, uh, or they're called a uh, Erdos random, or they're called a, uh, a um, Bernoulli random, uh, or just a, a random network. And what it's going to involve is people being connected to a mean number of connections um, in, in to other agents. In other words, where each agent is going to be connected to a certain number of fellow agents over time. Okay. So we're going to go to that. And despite what was said in the slides there, I think it's 10 connections we want per agent. Okay. 10 connections per agent, if you don't see it there. And we're going to run this. And I want to remind you what's going to happen is we're going to run this population connected in a network at the same time as we're running the stock and flow model. The key point is when we say this, 10 people per agent, it's going to pick them. It's going to pick them in a In other words, um, any two pairs of individuals, any, any pair of individuals, individual A and individual B, will be equally likely to be connected as long as A is different than B. So I'm not going to be connected more to people near me. I'm not going to be connected. If you and I are connected, we're not, we don't have any greater than average chance of being connected to other people that are connected to both of us or anything like that. No, no, no. It's, it's going to be. Any two pair of people have equal chance to be connected. So I'm going to run this. I'm going to run this baseline setting. Okay. We're going to run a baseline and we're going to compare what we see, whoa, what we see from the agent based model on the one hand with what we see from the, from the uh, stock and flow model. You'll notice that initially, in case you didn't catch it, there was just one person who started infected in the agent based model. They're the red here. All the other green are susceptible. And meanwhile, this stock and flow model is, is often simulating just fine. Don't worry, there'll be a, a presentation of it above. And you can see it's starting to connect. You can see these links here between people. Remember, any two pairs of different people, a, a pair of any, any pair of, of different people are equally likely to be connected. And you can see it in it's spreading. And then these, these uh, ones in gray are the recovery. Okay. Now, if you scroll up, you can actually see it playing out here in real time on this graph. So here's the system dynamics number infected, and here is the infective for the ABF. Okay. Here, so that's uh, infective SD and infective for ABF, and you can see they're they're very very similar. Can you see that? So red is the the SD infectives. Uh, and blue is the um, the ones from the ABM. You can see they're just about overlap. Can you see that there? Early on, okay. And so now they're coming down together. They rose together. They're coming down together. You might be forgiven for thinking, okay, they're they're very very similar. But then something starts to happen here. Um, I'll speed it up a little bit. What's going on here? Can anyone say, remember the blue is the APM and red is the SD. What, what are we seeing here happening over time? Anyone? Yes. Kenneth? Okay. Good. And why is that? Anyone? Why, why do we see this kind of up and down frenetic behavior kind of wandering around. Why do we see that? And the what does it reflect? What's going on here? I would have randomness. 
So if we were to go look at the age of base model, and I'm going to pause this for a moment. If we were to go look at the age of base model here, um, what we would see is that, for example, um, this chance of whether someone's infected or not depends on a roll of the dice with a certain probability they get infected if they're exposed. It's not a given. They're transmitting the infection is occurring on an average rate of a certain number of contacts per, per month. Um, but it's sometimes it may be more and sometimes it may be less. The recovery, the exact timing of it is, is a matter of chance. It's, it's occurring at a certain probability per unit time, but you know, they'll either recover sooner or they'll recover later, anywhere in between, but they're recovering at a certain time that's drawn from a random distribution, essentially an exponential distribution. And same thing with their loss of immunity. So there's a lot of stochastics here. There's vagaries of how many people they're connected to in this network. This guy happens to be at the end and you know he's, he's connected to a bunch here. She's connected to a whole bunch. Some of these folks are connected to more than 10, some are to less than 10. And gosh, if, if it hits the wrong person, they may communicate it to a lot of people, the disease. If, it, if, if, if it's one person who has few connections, they you may communicate it to others. You'll notice what's happening, right? You, you'll see. So, how similar would you say the ABM and the and the system dynamics model are here? Anyone want to comment on that? Is it similar? Is it dissimilar? Anyone comment? What are some similarities between the two? What was similar? Was there any similar? Yes, yeah, kind of. Yeah. That that's right. So like look early on, right? Um, you switch back and forth for this kind of period here before the first trough, and you, you can almost see they're almost overlap. Yeah. Exactly right. What else is similar? Yes, name again? Uh, Alex. Yeah, yeah it's, it's almost like the blue is almost a mean value, an average value that's pretty darn close to this red. So it's kind of going to an average, very similar to what the SP model is. Um, it's never quite exactly what the SP I mean, it's only rarely exactly that, but it's, it's going up and down around it, right? And that's going in these cycles. Anyone have a, have a gut feel? Why is it going in these cycles? Why does it go up and down? Why doesn't it just kind of wander upwards in some arbitrary way? Why, why is it going up and down around that? Like that? Maybe it takes off and flows. So this is again the vertical axis indicates number of people infected. If you get more people infected here for a while, what happens? The very act of infecting someone means that what else has happened? Yes. Um, yes. Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'm. I was just my next thought to remember the process. I'm the day for my benefits. So Alex, um, so yes, we're going to say, uh -huh. so you said, um, yeah. exactly. So it's undercutting itself, right? The fact that it's higher means it's, it's cut down the number of susceptibles remaining. And so just like, you know, the, the nightfall is the day, it's going to turn around eventually. It's undercut itself. And it's going to head down until the number of susceptibles are replenished because people are losing immunity from the recovery stage. So it's going to replenish it, and that will set the stage for another one. These little outbreaks are going on. Guess what's in our future? Yeah, it's going to be something like that. Um, okay, so 
some similarities, some differences. Um, we're capturing some variability in the ABM. Um, now I'm going to run this out for a while. I'm going to I'm going to um, uh, it's alas it, um, it it's it's set to only stop at at time three thousand. Um, I'm going to create. I'm going to copy this. Right click copy, and then I'm going to do paste. Boom. And I'm going to say, um, you know, uh, baseline without stop time, something like that. Um, and I'm going to say, yeah, okay, fine. Um, and I'm going to say stop never. Okay, here we go. There we go. I'm going to stop it. No, I'm running it for a very long time now. What am I, might, might I be getting at about another difference between the two? Anyone want to guess what might eventually happen, Kenneth? Yeah, just by chance, right? Like, like this is a population of a thousand, and it's it's possible by by sheer happenstance, maybe it will eventually die out. Now we don't know that for sure. It may be very, very unlikely, but gosh, it goes. Oh, look at that! Look at that! Did you see that? Well, okay, maybe. Maybe maybe I got to redo it. Um, um, maybe some of you shared in my excitement, but um, for those who who didn't, um, maybe glanced away at just the wrong time. Oh no! Look at look at what happened there. Of course, I'm. This is a little bit pre-planned. What what just happened? What just happened? Guess what happened? Look, look, there's only one person a different color and they're they're gray. What happened? Yeah, yeah or, or maybe they were connected, but they sent some messages which didn't happen to infect the people. And so, you know, they felt it, it, they were quite lucky and it just died out first, right? So stochastics can be important here. Stochastics can lead to evolution. Here we go. Here we go. We're running it again. Um, and you see it sort of playing out here. And you notice it's going pretty low sometimes. Um, hasn't quite hit that last. Oh, went extinct. So what happened there? Why did it go extinct? Anyone? Yeah, so so basically, no, they're simply for women. But it just so happened that you know the last the last two people that got infected couldn't pass it on to anyone. Maybe the people right around them, their neighbors in the network, were already infected or were recovered, and they couldn't pass it on. And and just by chance, they or they were recovered before passing on. So it's a lot of happenstance here, and it died out. That's the way. Things are in the world. I mean, you know, um, you can get die out of a bug. Um, and uh, we have a rather significant paper on this point with respect to drug resistant gonorrhea. Because, um, you know, a colleague of mine, an esteemed modeler, a fantastic uh, leader in Canada in the modeling front, published a paper on, on gonorrhea and uh, drug resistant gonorrhea. Uh, uh, gonorrhea uh, is sometimes called. Clap, and it is uh, a sexually transmitted infection that's unfortunately quite somewhat, uh, maybe a little bit more so in the age of Tinder. Um, and uh, and you know their model showed basically quite worrisome risk of emergence of drug resistance. Um, uh, and and how and one of the things it seems to show is that focusing on Certain types of intervention strategies might worsen the chance of drug resistance. The intervention might be effective in some regards, but might be might worse the chance of drug resistance. But one of the things you notice if you study it is the level of drug resistance goes down really low before it pops back up. And for practical populations, the chance of that happening is so small, it, it, it would need to be like down to one hundred thousandth of a person having gonorrhea first. Um, and realistically, that doesn't happen. It, it tends to die out. So 
infections, you know, infect particular people and you can get die out through just stochastics. Um, and you can fool yourself if you're dealing just with a with a model that is is aggregate in character. Um, okay, so I'm grateful to Larissa and, and others for sharing information about the model to open. So we've just seen one type of network, ladies and gentlemen. We've just seen a network that's known as Poisson random, Erdos random, um, uh, Bernoulli random, uh, or just random. Um, we're going to look at some other types of networks though as well. What type we want to look at, it can be a little bit confusing, but we're going to have people laid out in space. Um, and um, and we're going to have them uh, connected if they're nearby in space. Okay. So, so let's go explore that. Um, so uh, this one, we're going to go back to our baseline and we'll go down and we're going to, normally we would, modify this in a different scenario but in this case it's it's so easy to do it in main and and a bit more involved to do it in a scenario i'm just doing it here but don't you generally you want to be careful about doing this directly in the model changing the underlying model you should be changing scenarios i'm going to change it to a distance based connection a distant distance based connection with a connection range of <clears throat> 28.675. Okay, so I've chosen this one um, to give the same number of people connected. Okay, um, let's go take a look at this. Um, so now we're going to have people not connected, not any two pair of people connected with equal probability. This is what we just had. No, we're going to have people connected. If they lie within a certain distance of each other. So if we consider a given pair, person A and person B, um, if those, if person A and person B, let's call this person A, if person A and person B lie within a certain distance, they'll be connected and otherwise not. Okay. So any any two pair of people of agents will be connected if and only if they lie within a certain distance of each other. And if they lie further away than that distance, they won't be connected. So it tends to connect people with nearby people within a certain threshold. Okay. Um, and uh, you can imagine the network like that. I'm drawing it up from the board, but let's go run this and let's get the computer work for us, right? Um, it's what computers are good at doing silly little things very quickly. Okay. So, um, here we go, and, and we see now a, a network arrayed before us where people are connected to nearby people. And what just happened? Anyone? That same thing happened as happened before. The first person who got infected recovered before anything happened. So it's taking off there in, in system dynamics land and the land of the stock and flow model, but nothing is happening with the, with the agents. Nobody's infected. Because it died out before the person person recovered before they passed it on. Okay, that's just the luck of the draw. That's stochastics for you. It's just happenstance. You can imagine it's more like in a small population. I just restarted it though, and now you see something else going on. It's spreading. Now, what can you see if we just put our attention the patterns associated with this API? Um, the spread in that network. What what pattern do you see? I kind of laid people out first. What pattern do you see emerging from? Does anyone want to say? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That's good. So it's spreading local. It's spreading incremental. It's kind of spreading. At the edges, right? The kind of periphery here. So you can see it kind of percolating out, right? Um, across the landscape. So that's a key, a key observation. Absolutely key. Um, it's moving, it's spreading locally. Now, over time, that leads to spread to larger and larger areas, kind of like a wildfire in grass spreads, right? Now, why are some of these folks turning? 
turning green over here. Whereas these folks are mostly gray and then there's some red down here. Anyone parse that out? Why are these folks starting to turn green? They're becoming susceptible because they have lost immunity from recovery. Those are some of the first people that were infected and therefore they've now recovered. These are the folks who are more recently um, infected and are, are now largely recovered. And then there's some people very recently infected down here where it's still spreading down to the Estevan area. Well, no, it's not geographic area, but it, it's spreading still on that front. And now you're starting to see second waves of infection, right? Um, oh, it died out before it spread. Okay, so, so let's go look at what happened there. Now, now you could see the difference between the two. Um, anyone want to comment? Um, so this is infective for SD. This is the familiar pattern from last time. Nothing's changed. You haven't changed anything with the SD model. How about the ABM model? How close is that to the SD one? So this is the SD. You see this really rapid rise and, and drop here. Yeah. How do we? How does that compare with with what the ABM is saying with this with this distance based now? Anyone? Yes. Good. Good. Now, that's right. But the size of the peak is smaller now. There's an interesting question. Does that mean fewer overall people got infected? Do you think? Do you think a lot more, a lot fewer people got infected, or is it just spread out more? Anyone? Well, if I compose this for those mathematically inclined. That's the integral of this area. It's the area under this blue curve. Is that the same as the area under this kind of spike curve and, and red here? It turns out it's pretty much the same. It's, it's actually just spread out. Like you take this red curve and you sort of pull it down that way, pull the top down and spread it out. It turns out that in both cases, it's infecting just about everyone in the entire population. Okay, it's just that it's spread out more. Now, why did it grow slowly? What is it that let let it grow in a slower pace? I would say that something to do with the growth. Why is it slower? Yeah, it can only spread locally. I, I analogize this to a spread of fire in, in a grassland, but one thing that's different about it is in a grassland, you get sparks flying off, right? That go really far distances and that might might start, you know, reach uh, quite, quite a, a distance away. But if you start looking at how this is spreading here, there's, it's limited how quick it can spread. You know, it can only go a certain speed outwards, right? It, it can't leap across here. It can't infect all these people. There's a, there's a limit to it. There's a constraint here in how, how many people are connected to how many and, 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 and uh, how, you know, how quickly people, how people, how quickly people recover, et cetera. And so it'll spread, but it, it spreads at a certain rate outwards. This is true of many diseases, actually. That's the animal populations, rabies. If you look at rabies, um, you'll find that rabies spreads in these concentric circles, much like this. So, if we if we go and we restart that here, um, what and you start to sort of see this spread out. This is very similar to the pattern to rabies skunks, raccoons. You bite other raccoons in your body, and and it spreads outwards. Devil facial tumor disease, very similar, right? Um, it spreads outwards geographically. You don't get devils going and 
pumping over to down to Eagle Head, Hawks Neck, or you know across to to Western Tasmania, the bike going from Hobart to to the north or, or what have you. You instead have them biting nearby and it spreads out. So with animal populations that aren't that aren't that aren't flighting populations, they don't fly. This is very common. Deer, chronic wasting disease spreads out like this across the province. And indeed, Leah was also responsible for a chronic wasting disease model. So, ladies and gentlemen, when we have spatial immediate or distance based connection, we have a profound difference in the effects and spread. And at least the big differences from the system dynamics model, which causes random mixing. The system dynamics model says, do you remember it? Right? It says here uh, that each person basically can infect someone across the entire population. If you look at this, at this uh, equation, oh, mumble. Um, so I'm, I'm wanting to look at this incident flow here. And I don't know why it's, there it is. Okay. It's susceptible times force of infection. There's an overall force of infection, chance per unit time, so it'll be infected, right? 10% per day or something like that. And it's anyone in the population that can get infected in this whole darn population. An infective anywhere can infect the susceptible anywhere. It can spread very, very widely. And that's why when we have random connections, when we are connecting people willy nilly across this entire network, I wish I had another color. But when you're connecting people up, regardless of location, you know, any pair was equally likely to be connected. That's when they got similarities to that, to, to this system dynamics characterization. It was very similar at first, and then it kind of oscillated around that level. But when we're dealing instead with a situation with this distance-based connection, we see an entirely different beast. And to be complete, to complete the story, in Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll said, beginning, beginning, go to the end, and then stop. And I, I might as well go to that, except there's really no true end here, but there's a certain, there's a certain um, eventuality. You run it, and guess what happens? It dies out. Very quickly, very reliably. Why does it die out very quickly? Anyone want to say? Why does it die out with high confidence early on? Time and time again, it will disappear. Anyone? Why is that? You could run it again and again, and instead of going up tens of thousands of steps, it, it barely makes it like 250, 300. Yes, Alex. So, well, you got the, the gist of it. So, when it spreads, you know, it, it, it's like a wildfire in the sense that if you look at a wildfire in grass, if you've ever seen that in the dirt, it, it spreads out and if you look at where the fire is, it's on the edges, it's right on the rain around it. The middle is, is no longer fire, it's just burned a while ago. It's grass. Um, it's, it's really up on the edges. And it, it, it tends to burn itself up and it, it can't just pop back to the center in any way. Even if grass started to grow really quickly in the center and where it started and so on, it, it can't get back to that. There's it's like there's a barrier, right? There's like a firewall of recovered people, just like Alex said. Or people that are still affected as well, and you can't get past them. Right? It can only spread locally, just as Josh said. Can only spread locally, so it can't magically jump back across to where the new susceptible is. But time and time again, it might get a few chance events where oh, someone came to susceptible next to me while I'm still infected. But quite largely, the infections are in a different place in the system, as Alex said, than are the susceptible, the folks who have recovered from from infection. They're separated out, right? 
Now, there's many diseases which spread like that. I want to have a conversation with you. Do you think um, this is a good reflection of how uh, COVID spread? Do you think COVID spread like that? Why or not? Okay, it spreads a lot in families, spreads a lot in classrooms, right. um, spreads a lot in schools, spreads a lot in workplaces. And it's going to go from the workplace to the front of the home, spread within the city. And, and so there's a lot to be gained. But what, what is missing from this? That's an undeniable feature of our current existence. Right? Yeah. Uh, so I can hop into a plane and by tomorrow I could be in UK or I could be in, you know, Melbourne, Australia, or I could be in, you know, in South America and um, in, uh, you know, Brasilia or, or, uh, uh, San Paulo. Um, I could be in all sorts of different places quickly, and I could bring that with me. You think about it, planes are like, they're almost like, someone, I, I once heard a, a mathematical epidemiologist analogize them to like syringes. They go from one place to another. Like, they take a bunch of people, they pack them in a plane, maybe in Texas or not, they fly into a new city and then let them go. And, you know, it can bring infection, right? It can, it can bring effects across. And if I go down to Regina tomorrow to you know, talk with our corrections and policing partners or the Ministry of Health partners or what have you, um, I might bring bug there and might spread there. <laughs> so to a degree, you're right, to a degree, Josh, it's a, it's, a, it's a good description. For most of our contacts, they occur with local people. But but some undeniably are longer distance, right? And so there's a type of model that not surprisingly anticipates this. And it's called, sorry, what am I, 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 I meant to show the network types. Where, where's my list of network types? Okay, um, this, is, this is odd. I should have a list of, of network types instead of layout types, I'm sorry. Um, so list of, of network types, what you will find is uh, that, we'll, we'll actually go do it in, in main here, that we have a network type, which is called a small world network, okay? And a small world network here is a popular type of network. It's also known as a, uh, uh, a, a stroke at, a, a, Watts Strogatz network, that we're going to Watts and Steve Strogatz. Uh, Steve Strogatz is a mathematician at Cornell, and he had a doctoral student who's now quite famous in the network analysis area called Duncan Watts. And they created a network type called Small World, where it's mostly local, but it then it has some connection long distance. So the idea, as Josh said, most of my connections are to nearby people, but a small number are to our And it's to capture that fact that, that there's, there's some small bit of, of global, global connection. But to really understand this, I want to show another talk uh, first, and that's called a ring lattice network. So what we just looked at was a 2D connector. Um, uh, space, history space. The two, what we just saw was the first one was random. Any two pair, any pair of nodes is equally likely to be connected no matter where they are. It'd be this one and this one, this one, that one, this one, and this one, this one. However close or however far they are, they could like be connected. Distance based, it's kind of like the opposite, right? In 2D space, it's like a given pair will only be connected if and only if they log within a certain distance of each other. Right now, we're going to go to a ring lattice, and this is just like distance based, but in one dimension, a big ring. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to change the layout type here to be a ring. 
just so we can see it. The layout type is in a central. It doesn't care about layout. We're putting it in the ring, we'll let us see the chart. Okay. So this is going to be called a ring lattice network. I'm going to be connected with a couple neighbors on each side. Maybe it's one person on each side. Like we're in a big ring and I'm holding each person is holding the hands of the two people next to one on each side. They're holding one hand. And, and they're in a big ring. I'm saying that's kind of similar to one dimension. It's a single dimension. It's like a line, but just wrapped around to itself, as this was in two dimensions with the distance based network. In both cases, you're only connected to someone who's within a certain distance of each other. How do you think infection will spread on this one? A ring lattice. Anyone want to guess? How do you think it will spread? Good, it'll spread locally, that's right. In fact, this one, you can see them here. And you're exactly right, your name again? Shuhani. Um, you can see it spreading, right? It's spreading, just as Shuhani said, locally, it's spreading kind of along this ring. Each person here is connected to uh, 10 people on either side of them. Same number of connections we had for the for the uh, random one and the same number for the for the distance based connection. I'm connected with five on this side, five on that side. And it's spreading locally. But you'll notice it's not going anywhere quickly. Why why isn't it going anywhere quickly? In fact, it's dying out now. Let's let's try that again. Maybe Maybe we had a bum rap. Maybe we had a, you know, bad luck. Oh, dying out. I'm, I'm running at 100 times as fast, so I'll try to slow it down to, to, to let you catch in the action. But look, it's spreading. Oh, 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 and it dies out. Why is it dying out so frequently? What's going on? Yes, can I? There are actually five, five on each side, though. No? Actually, five. Yeah. 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 Cool. That's exactly right. Yeah. Like here's here it's on a run, um, but even now it's going slowly, right? And then it 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 ran out of luck, um, because me, my connections on each side. Are going to be largely overlap with the next person's connections and the next person. So if a person gets recovered, that's going to again be it's going to be like the start of a fire, right? It's going to be like a sandbag. If you get a couple of those in a row, it's going to be hard to get past that. You know, to, to, to effect. you get five of them in a row, and like it's game over, like you're not going to be able to get past it, right? Because the person on is affected on the side of them. They are, they're not reaching anyone beyond that. That group of five, that gang of five is blocking them. It's a fire. They can't spread. So, this is a type of infection. As Suhan said, it spreads slowly and it's also very easily blocked, right? It will be like imagining, you know, fire spreading along a string or something. It's really easy to stop fire along a string, right? <laughs> you go and you like stop. Step on the string and put water on the string at some places, and it just just dies out. It's not not very hard, and so it is with the ring lattice network. Okay, so this is the analogy to a two D distance based connection. This is a one D distance based connection. The other is two D. Now, I told you I wanted to show you this before looking. <laughs> So now let's look at a small world now. Having seen the natural dynamics of this, let us turn our attention now to a network type, which is the small world, okay? Once again, connections per agent 10, so five in each direction, same thing we just saw. And you notice it says neighbor link fraction. So this is asking, 
what fraction of my connections are with those five members on one side, five on the other? And my implication is what the rest of them are with anyone. It's like a mixture. My mind, my mind works. It's a mixture of two questions. One, where I'm connected only with people on both sides, a certain number on each side. What's the name of that one? You just saw it. It's called what? Ling Lines. Good. And this is a mixture with one where I have a probability, a certain probability of being connected with anyone, regardless of distance. No matter where they are, you've got equal probability of being connected with them. What's that called? Called what? Uh, yeah, a, a random, a random network, or for newly random, or Poisson random. Uh, that's what that's called, right? So a small world is like a weighted combination of them. It's like a combination of them. And less, and, and a uh, you know, Poisson random, or for newly random, or, or Airbus random. The one where any two pair of people, no matter how far apart they are, the certain probability of being connected. So let's go see that. So here we're connected with five people on both sides, but 10% of our connections, so it's one minus 0.9, are with anyone across the network. Let's go run this. I'm running it. Let's go check it out. Go see what happens. What, oh, you tell me, what dynamics would you expect this in here? So it's just like the ring lattice, except 10% of the connections are with people far away, you know, who could be anyone. I mean, what? How do you think it would modify the dynamics? Right? How do you think it would change things? It's only ten percent that are with people far away. So, like ten connections on average, on average, I one of them with someone who could be anywhere. You think that'll make a difference? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well spoken. Name again? Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, Jeremy. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Precisely. So here we go. This is what are these? What do you see across this? I know this looks like a dream pattern. What is this? What are these things going across? Yeah, that's the ten percent. Those are the long distance connections. Where are the rest of them? They're all just right on this green band. Um, but these are the long distance connections. These are like the flights across the world, right? These are like the flights from Saskatoon to Toronto, Saskatoon to, to Vancouver or what have you. Okay, here, they, here are the folks that start connecting. Oh, what do you see now? Just like Jeremy said, what do you see now? Sorry? Exactly, it's spreading across the world, right? It's spreading on a flight from Saskatoon to Sao Paulo, Saskatoon to London, Saskatoon to Victoria, Saskatoon to, you know, to Melbourne, whatever, and it spreads. Now, if we go and we look up here, what we find actually is that it led to quite a sharp infection. Um, you would have thought that, well, it's mostly local connections. I mean, surely it's going to be really, really slow, right? Um, but we don't see that. It's not, not actually borne out. It's, it actually spreads quite quickly. That's this one here. It spreads quickly, and, and then it tends to die out, right? Um, uh, so it actually has some attributes of both. It, it spreads quickly, almost like a random one. I say almost like a random one. Why is it spreading like a random one? early on. But then it tends to die out. Why is it dying out so reliable? Anyone? Well, it, it, only small fraction are, are across there. So after all, it, it can be blocked. Um, and uh, and it, it, it tends to, you know, run out of steam in terms of number of people to infect after a while. 
let's let's play around with these numbers if, if we can. So let's let's go over to Maine and let's make the neighborhood link fraction ninety five percent. So each person has ten connections total. So on average, it'll just be like most. You know, it'll be an average for every person we point flip whether or not they're connected with someone across the world. On average, three people. Well, the connection was so unlocked that, but you know, uh, ninety-five percent of the connections will be local. Only one out of twenty will be global. What do you think will happen here? What do you think would happen? Anyone? Sorry. Okay, well, it's spread quite as easily. You notice it's thinner, uh, can I? Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Good. It will be. It will be strong, but you notice it's still still spreading pretty far. But yes, you're right. It will. It will die out sooner with with greater reliability boom it goes down to to just about zero but it does spread pretty quick nonetheless it has to find that 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 person who has those long distance connections maybe it has to spread a couple of people before it hits that person who flies all the time to sydney australia right uh to deliver boot camps and hackathons um and uh and you know, here we we see it again. You know, it's it is spreading, but the, the picture here is pretty profound. But it turns out it totally changes the the, 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 the uh, dynamics of this network. If we had kept it at here at um, at a uh, and I I didn't do this and I showed it. If we had it at a as a ring lattice network purely, and we looked at the dynamics of that, what you'd see is is very different. It would often, you know, it peter out often very really reliably. With with sometimes it won't spread at all, and sometimes it will spread like this at a time it's not spreading at all, and sometimes it would spread just a little bit and it would it would burn out. But when we have these long distance connections, it's probably going to end up infecting just about everyone, and then and then burn out. Um, it 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 will increase as as Kenneth said the the strength of the firewalls but you notice like this it's kind of creeping along and then it kind of dies out kind of peters out but just those five percent of connections being long distance boom it makes all the world in the difference all the world is different you know we could we could try pushing it right we could say 98 percent what do you think of 98 percent were were more purely local. Well, it's going to be even thinner, right? And you're going to have to really travel to find, you're going to have to go a few links to, to find that person who's got some global connection. But look, spread it does, right? Look at that. It's spreading pretty much across the population because just a few of those long distance connections will spread it out. It, it is spread out a bit, but, and it will die out, but it will, it will spread. So what is it? It's just a matter of, of um, you know, the, 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 the having a large fraction of those connections remotely, you know, distant connections. Even a small number is enough to change the dynamics of this network. So, what we're talking about here is here are things that modify not just the structure of the network, but the dynamics of it, the behavior of it. The structure of the network drives that behavior. It drives the stuff we see at And just a little bit of, of these connections. Here are two percent of them. Being in that sort of dream catcher type way will, will really change the dynamics. But most of these connections, I hope it will seem seem clear to you, exhibit behavior very different, very different from what we see. 
So it's not to say it's not the most recent for the whole thing. It's not. The number of professors on the rise, the number of contractors, the number of recoveries. So all that recent whole. But stock and flow model description of this, assuming random mixing, is at great variance. It's very different from what we actually see in a real way when, when it starts spreading. And so it is with the view of the world. Um, for some of these, you know, it may be that we can get an initial match, like for random network. Um, but for most of these networks, it's quite different. Now I want to end with you with the type of network that's going to occupy us next time. And that's a network that's very, very important, very notable. And it's called a scale free. Okay. Um, and if you go and go to Maine and you pull it down, you will find that there's a scale free network here. And um, I'm choosing up, and that's this parameter M, which is related to the pubs, the number of pubs or what have you. But basically, this will uh, just approximately half the average number of connections. Um, that are uh, that people have in this network. So we're going to run this um, with a scale-free network. Now, a scale-free network, we're leaving it in this ring lattice layout, okay? And you see, oh my gosh, it's really dense. It's kind of hard to see. So I'm going to run it with a smaller number, okay? Um, you know, maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll run this and and we'll we'll let it. Um, We'll sort of let it run, and then we'll um, we'll see if we can see the dynamics, and then I'll I'll, I'll show you a picture that's a little bit clearer here. Okay. Um, so here's a scale-free network. Um, so it's again the blue compared to the green. Um, how does it compare blue to green? Anyone? Here's blue, and here's green. Sorry, a blue to, I'm sorry, to red. Blue to red. Anyone? Similar or different? Yeah, it seems I think pretty similar to the to the average here for, for these connections, right? Um, and in this particular case, it, it seems to be a, a fairly uh, good description. Um, in general, a scale-free network can spread faster than random. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain why this is. Um, so we're going to um, go, and I think I'll use this population 100 example. Okay, there's a, there's a scenario called population 100, and I'll, I'll run it with that. Same, I remember I changed main to change the network type, so we'll, we'll see it. And this is what we see. Does anyone notice anything? It doesn't look quite balanced about this. Does anyone notice a, a pattern here? It comes to the text. It doesn't it look a little bit different here. A little bit off balance. Yeah, there's a lot more connection down here on the right. Down here, particularly sort of this lower, lower right hand side. And there's something going on here as well. Most people have somewhat fewer connections here, but some people have lots of connections. And indeed, that is the defining characteristic of a scale free network. Or that's one of the defining characteristics. It reflects the fact that most people are going to have, on average, might have fairly few connections, but some people are going to have tons. The average number of connections might be 10, but maybe most people have two or three. And and just you know, ten percent of the population has hundreds or something like that. Now that might strike you as strange, but um, it turns out that it's um, it's quite um, it's quite a common situation. Um, and uh, you'll see here that you can get sort of most people have around five or six or something like that. But then some people have, you know, 45, 50, et cetera. And you can get bigger differences. Can anyone think about 
some aspects of current society, particularly uh, places like U.S. Um, and and you could also do some from Canada or other other countries where you have this kind of imbalance. Most people don't have a lot, but some people have tons. What what sort of thing is that group? Yes, there. Yeah, yeah. So you get many people have in Cuba. There's a concentration of just a few people. That's right. Right, and, 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 a, and a smaller segment, twenty-five percent of the population, or something like that. Um, uh, so Chinese population, for example, was like that for many years. Seventy-five percent were rural, but you know, twenty-five percent were urban, and had tons and tons of connections compared to those in rural areas. What's another character? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Our income um, or wealth, family wealth. Uh, absolutely. Um, and it turns out this is true for a lot of different spheres of, of activity. It's also true in the cyber sphere with connections between websites or number of visitors that they have. A small number of sites is zillion visitors. And then the average site has much smaller number of this. It's true with you know hit web pages if you get into Google search. In general, when we have these processes where more breeds more, having more on um, you know more visibility on a website means more people are aware of it, which means more people go there, and it tends to build on itself. Visibility on you know, social media can be the same thing. Um, a wealth can be the same thing. It allows you to, you know, uh, to, to make use of uh, economical methods, you know, own your own house rather than renting or, or, or have a vehicle rather than having to, uh, to you know, uh, pay uh, every day for, uh, for transport or what have you, it allows you to have a greater choice of jobs. And therefore, able to adapt it allows you to have the flexibility to, to have someone for childcare, which allows you to hold down a job um, uh, through the day or what have you. So, so there's a lot of cases where having access to resources or, um, can breed more resources. Um, and money is one area, but uh, you know, hits to websites, uh, uh, follower count, etc. And you see there what are called power law distributions. And this is what we'll be talking about next time. There are these statistical distributions that show this. And we conducted studies through our campus with smartphones. Correct me. Some people who want to talk about the study, we got contact patterns. There are pictures of that that are skilled. Some people are certain butterflies and lots and lots of connections. Some people have a much smaller number. For the length of time, people are in contact. Um, tends to be a lot, tons of time with a few people, and then less time with, with, with a, a much larger number. Um, so we'll see next time about scale free networks. And scale free networks have their own dynamics. So today, what we've talked about is networks, network structure as driving dynamics structure of time. And we've seen that different types of networks have very different types of dynamics of behavior over time. We've further seen that in an age-based model, the spread of, it, of, of contagion, for example, can be quite different with some of those network structures than what we see in a stock and flow model, a system dynamics model, an aggregate model. They can be quite different. Although for some, like a random network, it could be reasonably similar. You still get these differences in stochastics that could lead to things like it never taking off in the first place or it dying out. So those are some things to bear in mind, a relevance to assignment three. Next time we're going to be going into this issue of scale-free networks. Uh, and we'll see more why they are so, so important and why network structure and uh, disparities in, um, in, in contact patterns, for example, is so important for infection spread. Okay, so that's all for today. As normal, I'll hold office hours now.
in the classroom and if if we wind up in the classroom i'll be in my office uh, so thanks very much